What does it mean to live life to the fullest, train to your potential and perform at your best? Leave nothing on the table. That's a non-negotiable, is that I, I strive to be better every day. Because if I'm not on top of my game, how is anybody else going to follow me down the road? Keep demanding more of yourself to, to live up to that potential and to stay hungry. Training is progress. You know, when I look at the word training, I think of steps, baby steps to get somewhere that you want to be. And that is basically your life journey. It's a mindset in itself, man. It's like, it's not just about, I know that for you, a lot of that's about the physical, but we're constantly in training, whether it's growing our skill sets, whether it's growing our physical bodies, whether it's growing our relationships, whatever. And all of that's a training ground. And that kind of goes back to the mindset that we just talked about. You underestimate yourself and you don't even start. But then once you start, you often surpass what you thought you could do. Perform at your best, mate. That's that's sort of what life is all about. You know, you want to have the knowledge, you want to have the fitness, the health, the ambition and drive that no matter what comes along, when that next phone call comes, I can just say, yes, I don't have to worry. Just go and do it. Hey guys, welcome to today's episode of the Live, Train, Perform podcast. I'm your host, Sean Kober, and joining me in today's episode are the lads from Swiss 8. Anyone that's been following the podcast for a long time knows that I speak about Swiss 8 a lot. It is a proactive mental health program designed to allow people to structure in eight pillars of health and wellness to become better at life. Adrian, Max, welcome to the podcast, boys. How are you, mate? G'day, mate. Very good. How you doing, Max? Good, good, good. It's good to see you, brother. That hair looks amazing. <laughs> I always oh, talk about any any time I uh, I ask people questions uh, on the, the Swiss Eight principles, which one of them is most important for them. Um, a lot of times, people say discipline, sleep, blah blah blah. blah but um, a lot of the military guys that I've spoken to are like, yeah. Whenever I got out of the army, like I stopped cutting my hair and I stopped shaving and shit like that. And you're going through that same process right now, bro. <laughs> yeah, I think it's my transition. I'm 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 living it and breathing it. So. <laughs> Mate, it's a struggle trying to. I like to say that I do a lot of fitness, but um, <laughs> in the process of doing it, uh, it gets in your hair. You got to do hair bands. It's a thing. <laughs> I can't say it's anything I've ever experienced. Adrian, you've experienced this, mate. Your hair was pretty long uh, this time last year when you were over here. Yeah, got, well, it was long. I never wore a bloody ponytail, but <laughs> Max, no, it was. And you're hundred percent right, mate. Um. When you start to train, hair goes in your eyes. That's it's the the old military mindset of like I'm growing hair just because I can now, even though there's yeah. not a lot of function in having long hair. <laughs> not my Absolutely hair, not. it's too thin. I don't know. What do you reckon about that, Max? I'm sure you've got different ideas, mate. You're rolling that long hair there. There must be some benefit to it. Just rebelling against 18 years of getting my hair cut short. Maybe we're going for a look. <laughs> I think. Um, yeah, I don't know, mate. We'll try, we'll try and figure it out. I think Hawaiian shirts and long hair and beards is the relaxed look. I don't know if that <laughs> if that's going to port over to corporate, but um, during COVID, we're a little bit more relaxed. I think business suits and a ponytail is going to be a bit a bit difficult. I don't know if we, I can pull it off effectively. <laughs> You're up in Darwin as well. Um, now, we're going to talk about your transition in a moment because you uh, have transitioned from the military back to civilian space uh, the most recently. Um, but for those people who haven't been listening to the podcast for that long, I did do an interview with Adrian, who is the founder of Swiss 8, probably about six months ago. Um, and we discussed, uh, why Swiss 8 was started, uh, what they were working on, their vision that they were working towards. Uh, we had a really good conversation. So if anyone wants to go back and listen to that episode, uh, I'll have that linked in the show notes. Um, after that interview, I went through, uh, the eight pillars of health and wellness. Um, sleep, nutrition, uh, discipline, time management, fitness, personal growth, mindfulness, and minimalism. And then I rounded out that uh, 10-part mini-series with an interview with Tristan Rose uh, of Blind Tiger Yoga, who is the subject matter expert on the mindfulness component. So, um, Adrian, just for any new audience members, uh, can you just give them a brief, uh, quick and dirty five-minute introduction to yourself and what you're doing right now, what your role is with Swiss 8? Yeah, mate. Um, pull me up if I start to waffle. Um, five minutes will, <laughs> should be enough. Easy. Uh, so obviously I, I was in the army like the, you boys were as well. Um, uh, my, my story was I, I wanted to be in the army forever. Like uh, aspiring to SF was kind of the goal. Uh, I got it in, in the, the kind of busiest time. 
uh, the best time possible if you're a young the soldier. Glory you days, mate. Go the, glory the glory days. The glory days of the army, of the military. Um, and then I, I left uh, a month before I did SAS selection. My sister died uh, and, and kind of halfway through SAS selection is, is when it kind of caught up with me, uh, became a reality. And, and I didn't have emotional intelligence back then. Didn't really know what how to process anything. Um, and it buckled me a bit. I, I left selection. I was out of the army fairly quickly after that. Uh, I dove straight into business, which um, I'm fairly ADD. Like I need to be doing something. I need to be focusing my mind on something all the time. Business is the perfect, um, not gap fill, but perfect distraction. It, it's something that you, requires all of your attention all the time if you're going to do it well. Uh, and it was the perfect distraction for me because it meant that I spent another three or four years not having to deal with emotion, um, which is fantastic. Uh, and then when I when I sold those businesses and had a lot of spare time, nothing really motivating me, nothing to getting me out of bed. That's when the wheels fell off for me. Um, and and. Thankfully, around that time, I started to catch up with the boys again. I went nearly three years after I left the military without going and hanging out with the boys because most of the boys then were either in SF units or still in Townsville, um, which is Townsville, Sydney, um, Perth for, for us in Australia. Um, and I was in Newcastle, so nowhere geographically close to the boys. Uh, and then when I, people start getting married, we're catching up. Um, Everyone starts to slowly, especially on the piss, starts to slowly vent their baggage and, and talk about what they're going through in life. Um, and we, we started to discuss like all the, what was happening in life when we were mentally positive, mentally healthy, and what was, what was our lifestyle like when we weren't. Um, reoccurring patterns with all of us, um, were if we were motivated by something, if we had a purpose, if we were driven to do something, get out of bed. Training well, eating well, sleeping well, everything was good. Uh, and, uh, the vice versa. If, if we weren't, if we didn't have a reason to get out of bed, if we were training poorly or not training at all, drinking piss too much, not sleeping, not eating properly, um, you get anxious and depressed really quickly. And, and so we started to put together a concept of, we, we did a bunch of research. We realized this stuff had been studied to death over the last 20 years individually. No one had put it together holistically. Uh, as uh, holistic health models to proactively um, drive reduction in, in anxiety and depression. Um, so we, we put together a concept, as we were just discussing before this, because the original concept was uh, get a farm, run lessons, run courses, bring 10, 20 people in at a time, teach them some stuff. The end state being we just wanted to, we had some lessons that we'd learned. We wanted to pass them on to young diggers, young people getting out of the military, it took us five to 10 years to learn the things the hard way. We wanted to pass that stuff on straight away. Um, financially, we couldn't do it. We couldn't buy a farm and, and run courses. It cost about two million bucks to set up the whole concept and then train 10 people at a time. Then, unfortunately, um, mine, the, our kind of inner circle started dropping like flies. We started losing guys fairly rapidly to suicide. Um, and the first of which being, uh, well, not the first, but the, the big one for us was Jesse Bird. That was the catalyst that kind of said, you've got this idea, get it rolling now, or you spend your whole life focusing on money and business and, and what you're supposed to do in the Western world, and you're going to have no mates left to fucking tell stories with. So sort that out um, quickly. And that was it. And and that was where Swiss 8 was born. We turned it into an app, um, took these habits and, and rolled them out. Uh, and the rest is history. I mean, we're obviously an organization that's growing, trying to evolve do new things in the tech space. We are a tech startup essentially, um, but everything we do is to to build interventions for, for mental health. Mm, mm. Here we are. That was solid, mate, right on five minutes. Well done. Perfect. <laughs> Max, your turn, mate. Give me five minutes, quick and dirty. Time is on. Go. Uh, mate, literally join the infantry like everybody else and and that was going to be it's either jail or or join the infantry uh no i was going to join up as a as a cav officer to be honest and um the with that hair you would have suited mate yeah <laughs> i reckon <laughs> mate but the recruiter had different ideas he was a infantry um sniper and so i guess it was a sniper supervisor and was like I think I rocked up, mildly intoxicated to, to recruiting uh, or hung over and he took one smell of me. He was like, nah, mate, you're going to join the infantry. That's for you, mate. So joined up and, and was privileged, like I said, with Adrian. I mean, we got in 2002 to 2018 and, and for the first 10 years, it was like perfect, mate. Perfect to mm -hmm. be able to go over and serve your country. 
got it in and then thought about going to the next level selection and, and stuff like that uh, and wasn't successful. So kept on going and, and Sergeant was sort of the pinnacle that I I, I felt that I, where I wanted to sort of get to um, and maybe have a poke at CSM, see what, see what was sort of going on. But for the current climate, uh, I just saw the CSMs just miserable sitting in their offices for 16 hours a day with no FaceTime with the lads. So I sort of made a decision and maybe for the sake of having kids down the track, I thought my body's not really holding up and maybe get out and, and, and sort of progress with Swiss 8 because start, things started happening and the conversations and sort of, sort of gave me a tap on the shoulder one day and said, hey, look, we either fucking do it now or we're going to go to another funeral. So like, fuck. I mean, let's do it. So here I am, mate. Yeah, man. Here we are. Here we are having this conversation. Now, you're, as I said before, you're out of all of us, you're the one that's uh, discharged or, or transitioned from the military to civilian space the most recent. Um, how long ago was that? And you uh, you spent 18 years in the army, right? Yep. And then you transitioned when? Was that like last year, this time last year when we were doing our yoga course? October. October, man. Oh, really? Uh, I, I didn't get out till October. Yeah. So, um, mate, we had James Long, who was the uh, he's a current serving CSM in uh, he's managing Delta Company or the you know the rehabilitation company slash platoon, and it's just a difference on I think who manages you going out, and I don't think it was a byproduct of being a sergeant at all. Um, mm. It's it's the same as for for a digger all the way through. But we, I just, I was just cognizant of it, mate, and knowing the system, and I think expectation management, mate, for me, was massive. Yeah. I knew DVA was clogged up. I knew that if I needed to get out, I need to, I need to really forecast, and that way, mm-hmm. it's in where I think I'm going to be, and I'm not getting frustrated at a situation that I can't control. Uh, mm-hmm. And mate, he looked after me. We did a lot of meaningful engagement stuff. Uh, which was yoga and doing courses the army's paying for and fucking yeah, here man. I am, mate. Dude, that's a that's a really good point, right? Like, you know, you have gotten out the mo- most recently and, you know, you've got all of these guys that did get out, you know, six, eight, ten years ago that have walked the path before you. So they're already giving you the, these tools to essentially prepare you because – um, I've spoken to a number of people on the podcast and, you know, the transition process is typically done from people who are still in the military that haven't gone through the transition process. So, it's like, what the fuck would they know? Um, so, you've had, I guess, the luxury of having your mates go before you that have walked that path that are then passing on that uh, lived experience to give you the tools and some of the techniques and some of the things that you can um, pretty much look out for. And as you said, forecast, knowing that walking back into the civilian space, you know, you're not going to be able to rely on other people as much as you rely on the boys in the army. You're not going to be able to, you're not going to be holding people to the same standards as you hold your soldiers to and the guys either side of you. Um, I think that's, um, that's, that's a massive positive, man. And that's essentially what the whole concept of is of Swiss 8. You know, for me, it is about um, helping like our generation that have gone through that transition process and you know, I've read a lot of studies where uh, they're talking about um, like signs of PTSD and things like that showing up roughly 10, mi- uh, 10 years after the event, roughly a decade after the event where, you know, people have a little bit more time to um, sit back and um, get a little bit introspective about their life and things that have happened to them uh, and they're no longer as distracted as they were before then. So, all these signs and symptoms start coming up and um, for me, like it's important to have these tools to be able to apply them at the appropriate time. But not only that, for our generation, you know, guys that are still in at the moment that or have just recently got out, got out over the last couple of years or guys that are getting out, you know, over the next year or two. Um, so I think these tools are fucking amazing, man. And I'm 100% behind you guys and will always support what you guys are doing. So uh, it's a pleasure for me to be on board as an ambassador for you guys. No, nah, man, I, I really appreciate it, dude. I, I, having someone like you that, that's from that sort of high-performing background as well that can see the utility in it, I, I I just think people sort of go through life, speaking to that last point you made about about waiting that 10 years for stuff to come up, I think that's probably one of the big ones. A lot of the boys, or some guys, and I'm trying to use, I'm not mincing words, but 
uh, I, I think people um, they compartmentalize or just get on with life while they're in the military. They're so fast, and and like you said, it's, it's going so quick that to go and get treatment, uh, to go and see a psych and go, hey, just do a bit of a tune up and say, hey, is things going okay? It's a pretty big can of worms to open up, and and it's, I don't think it's a, as effective getting treatment while you're serving and then having to perform, going to a psych, spilling the beans, and then going back to work and pretending you're a platoon sergeant. It's kind of hard to throw those hats uh, on and off. Um, and I think maybe once you get out and you do take that time and you start that introspective journey, maybe then there's there's the four. But I don't want to predisposition people to thinking that in 10 years I'm going to have PTSD. Like, I think that's the biggest – you can be completely fully functional, right? Yeah. If you don't have yeah, to that's automatically a- 10 years, oh, I've got PTSD, I'm now going to drink and I'm a broken veteran. Yeah, that's a great point, man. It's like, you know, prevention's better than cure. And this is the whole fucking idea of this proactive model. It's like, don't wait until you're in a position where you need to ask someone for help. Fucking put your hand up and go, all right, I'm, I'm, I can feel the wheels are coming off. I'm drinking a little bit too much. I'm, my energy levels are low. My testosterone's fucking crashed. I've got no sex drive because of I'm not exercising. I'm not eating properly. I'm not getting enough sleep. I'm not getting enough sunshine. Like, what can I fucking do right now that's going to Put the handbrake on and stop me rolling down that fucking hill. Let's put the handbrake on and then let's start putting those tools into place that's going to, you know, turn me around, get me back on the right tracks and just get me moving in the right direction. And once I can do that, then I add another tool. Then I add another tool. Then I do it for longer. Then I, you know, I, it's progressive overload, man. You know, we need to look at these tools and we need to apply the, appro- the appropriate dosage at the appropriate time. You know, I, I spoke to... um uh, you guys did the interview with Simon Maloney, the sniper that got shot in the throat in Afghanistan. Fucking legend, mate. I just had a conversation with him recently. Um, the episode's going to be dropping on Monday, um, a couple of weeks ago by the time this drops. But, um, you know, something we spoke about there was when we did our yoga course last year, you boys are on the course, you know, we all had that conversation. It was a course full of veterans, heavy hitters, infantry soldiers that have been fucking on the ground, that have been fighting and you know, yoga is or can be used as a great tool, particularly yin soul yoga, where you're sitting there, you're stretching, you're focusing on your breath, um, you're practicing mindfulness meditation, okay? But if you get a dude who's just come back from Afghanistan who's in a fucking highly sympathetic state and they're sitting in a yoga class for an hour being told to fucking breathe, man, they're probably going to wig out. They're not going to want to be there. So that tool, whilst the principle is correct, the dosage is not appropriate. So we need to figure out what that dosage is. And that might be for someone like fucking sit down and take five deep breaths over the course of one minute. You might just start there, do that every day for a week and then add another minute and then add another minute, so on and so forth. Yeah, the um, I'm doing a stuff. Uh, so um, the functional approach to, uh, to yoga, which is one of Tristan Rose, Blind Tiger, his mentor, um, we're finalizing the courses there. And he talks about a yoga being the step, the journey to introspection. And we do that by, instead of teaching people, oh, feel how you feel and it doesn't work. If we teach people, hey, hold this stretch for five minutes. And then at the end of the five minutes, when you release the stretch and you notice the rush of blood and feeling and movement, then we start, we start, we start internalizing those sensations and we can move that you know, by stretching and moving those muscles in the seven archetypal poses, we start to get the feeling of what that energy is moving around our body. And then as we sort of progress, we can do it with our breath and imagining moving that body with breathing, right? And then as you progress mm. through this, through the seven limbs of yoga or whatever it is, um, you can, you can gain introspection, but they say that yoga is the start of learning introspection by your physicality and i think that can be achieved not just with with fucking yoga but strength training or whatever people's meditation or motivation is yeah um just to add to that as well like again for me everything comes back down to principles right so the way that i think about and the, the, the reason i believe that and i might be fucking completely wrong but i think about principles and the reason i believe the yin style yoga is effective is because you control your breathing and you pay attention to your breath. Now, if we think about how the breath um, creates a physiological response in the body, then we can start to understand 
how we can use our breath to chill out, to calm down, to drive the parasympathetic nervous system. So if I sit here and I start fucking hyperventilating, what's that can do to my heart rate? My heart rate increases, my respiratory rate increases, my muscle tone increases. I drive the sympathetic nervous system, which is the fight or flight state. But if I can, you know, sit down, take some nice deep breaths, put on some like relaxing meditative music, set that environment, go through those nice long deep breaths, long inhales, pause, long exhales, that's going to have a physiological response where my heart rate decreases, my respiratory rate decreases, um, you know, my muscle tone decreases. I read a study actually saying that um, 10 minutes of breath work, meditation, mindfulness, call it whatever the fuck you want to do. Breath work where you're driving the parasympathetic nervous system is actually just as, if not more effective than doing mobility work prior to going into a heavy um, strength session. And that's simply because you're calming the central nervous system, you're releasing um, the, the tension, the tone in the muscles by down-regulating that sympathetic nervous system, which is the stress response of fight or flight. So that makes perfect evolutionary sense to me. And again, the principles are what's most important to me. So finding those tools that are going to apply those principles correctly at the right time in the appropriate dosage, that's where the fucking magic is for me. I think it's, I think, yeah, finding that, uh, finding the underlying principles, removing the woohoo, and then finding, and then changing it so that it is palatable for your particular audience, uh, and then an instructor that they believe in that will help them is, is also easy at the start, right? So instead of having someone trying to teach you, cause I can't do, I can't do asana, uh, the, like the more active yoga poses and focus on my breathing because I'm too, I'm a, I've got the flexibility of a stick. And <laughs> when they're like, and just, and now imagine the color green and relax and move with your breath and, and move like, with I your can't breath. move at all. I, I'm just fucking out of breath. I'm burning and I fucking hate you. So yeah. <laughs> mate, Adrian, you've been the quiet there. Sorry, go on. Oh yeah, mate. Sorry. Earlier on I ran out because the fucking dog was whinging. <laughs> um, not my dog, a dog. Uh, anyway, no, I, I, when, when Mex gets in a flow talking about his yoga, mate, I love listening. But I, I think the, the biggest p- takeaway that I, I pull from, from that whole thing is, is that the, the way it's delivered or the person it's delivered by is so important. Like the, the wo- yoga's been fucking destroyed by flower, dyed eyed shirt, fucking hippies. Who I have no problem with, right? I used to be one. Love hippies. However, they've, <laughs> they've, they've hijacked yoga. Like breathing, stretching and meditating is essential for everyone who wants to be healthy. Um, optimally healthy in some form or another. But if you up, even, even today, like they are preaching, you've got to get your energy right. You've got to, you, you're on the wrong vibration, man. And like that turns most people off straight away. But you put yeah. a scientist in the room and you're like, humans are made up of atoms. Atoms are made up of energy at its fucking smallest sense. All uh, atoms in your body are vibrating at a certain frequency. That makes complete sense. So if mm-hmm. my if I'm vibrating incorrectly, then something is physiologically going to be wrong or potentially will be wrong in the future. Now, if, if a doctor, a scientist or a high-performing athlete or an exercise physiologist or a, a coach sits down and, and explains it to you like that. You're like, oh, well, maybe I should pay a little bit more attention to this um, meditation, this this breathing concept, this energy vibrational stuff. If I go on YouTube and I see a or on Instagram and I see a chick telling me how to do a headstand and get my vibration right, I'm like, no, nah, maybe this shit's not for me. Um, they're preaching the exact same thing. I don't believe that 99% of the girls preaching it on Instagram, girls and guys actually, preaching the, the, the woo-woo model on Instagram actually know what they're talking about, uh, scientifically, but the, the concept, they're on the right track. Um, so when you talk about prescription and dose, 100%, and it's also the tools that you adopt into your own routine or your own holistic model, um, are often biased by the person who is, is pushing the information towards you. And that's something mm-hmm. we need to start changing. Breath work. I mean, the book, I just finished James Ness's book called Breath. Um, and it changed the game for me. Like some of the, the techniques, that, I mean, he, he goes deep um, around the world talking about. I've, I've spent the last four weeks 
training every day without opening my mouth, just nose breathing. Uh, and already, I like having up my cardio because that's heaven forbid. Already, workouts are getting easier. Um, you walk into a gym on day one, close your mouth, don't open your mouth at all while you're on a uh, um, assault bike, what, whatever you're doing, rowing. It feels like you're suffocating, just trying to mm-hmm. nose breathe when you're getting gassed. After, I mean, it's been four weeks. After, it's probably two and a half, three weeks of doing it. I, I finished the same, uh, it took me the same amount of time to get the same distance at the same intensity. I didn't feel gas at all. Um, mm. And that for mine is, again, I wasn't doing extreme cardio. I wasn't getting super fit. Uh, and, and that was why I was having that kind of response. It was just through breathing. And I mean, the way he delivered it in his book made sense to me. If someone sat me down and, and said, hey, come to my meditation breathing class, a year ago, I would have said, no, nah, I'm good. Thanks, mate. But now it's something that I'm diving into heavily. Um, mm. That's a good I point, mean, man. Sorry, go on. Oh, I was going to say, I've only scratched the surface. Like, I, I don't want to talk too much at the moment about breath work because mm. I, I don't want to be a pretend Instagrammer that um, reads one article and becomes a, a self-confessed expert. So, But there is, I've scratched the surface and it's changed the game for me already. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I, this is coming from, I've, I've done plenty of breathing style meditation in the past, but I didn't focus on the act of breathing. I just focused on the fact that breathing was my distraction from thinking, um, mm-hmm. which is a great place to start. Like it was a, it was a way for me to turn my brain off and just try and get present. Um, whereas now the, 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 the concept of pushing out carbon dioxide, which is what he goes into, uh, fairly deeply is something I'm heavily focused on. Uh, and it's starting mm. to change the game for me in in multiple areas of life. So yeah, it's good. Mm. That's a great point, mate. Um, you know, people, if if that's your entry level, is just focusing on your breathing to you know become a distraction from your own mind. Then that's a good place to to start. Okay, but then you need to take it to the next level. And and as you said, man, like you're using that your breathing as a tool. You're not using your breathing. Or well, you're not using that assault bike or that workout to fucking hammer yourself and improve your cardio. You're literally using that to focus on your breathing. Now, a point that I want to make here is when you do that, when you're focusing on your breathing just through your nose, you're not breathing through your mouth, you actually focus on breathing correctly. And that means diaphragmatic breathing. And the diaphragm is a muscle. And just like muscles, if you don't use it, you lose the ability to contract that muscle. So that's literally all you're doing is you're training your diaphragm to contract, relax, contract, relax. And you're pushing. And this is, you made a really good point there, man, um, about carbon dioxide. Most people, when they jump on an assault bike, like that, or they're doing a cardio session, they're trying to breathe in more. But what they actually need to do is breathe out more and exhale the carbon dioxide that's been exchanged for oxygen so that when they do ta- do take that next breath in, they're able to utilize that oxygen. 100%. And that was the, the biggest takeaway for me was, I mean, it's, I mean, he wrote, he's obviously, his book's killing it because he's, he's dropping some knowledge that it goes against what most people see, think is common sense. Um, for, for most of my life, we were taught that if you're going to exert yourself, you need to get in more oxygen. And that's why it's always like big, deep breaths in. You don't really give a shit about breathing out. Uh, and and uh, this whole chapter is talking about people's um, posture and the fact that they're not exhaling properly. It's it's causing headaches, migraines, a whole bunch of stuff. I mean, he goes into face dysmorphia, but that's a story for another day. Um, but yeah, <laughs> like the, the feel of the response we get, and this is like the whole Wim Hof thing too. There's breathing techniques that can warm your body up. By not allowing yourself to release carbon dioxide, there's there's breathing techniques that calm you down. Um, that is by slowing your breath, but also by deliberately pushing out the exhale. And that's I, I had no idea. I thought it was all about oxygen intake, but it is is more important to focus on getting rid of carbon dioxide. Mm. Great point, mate. Fuck, I just lit. Mate, I want to forget this book. <laughs> Got to read that book, mate. It's a game changer. I haven't read it yet, but it is definitely on my list. I, I sort of noticed even stopping it and not being a an idiot about it all, but when I sort of started getting super fucking frustrated at things, uh, whether that's at lights or whatever, noticing what state I'm in, like body-wise, and the first thing was I was holding my fucking breath, mate. 
just like n- not like subconsciously as soon as something's happening and i'm starting to twist off i'm like you're holding your breath breathe as soon as you start breathing i'm like ah it's not that bad it's gonna be all right even that like play around with um I, i'd butcher it if i try and paraphrase but um play around with if you hold your breath on an inhale that's generally what you're doing when you're about to twist off at the traffic lights but holding your breath on an exhale um, can be used, you've got to manipulate it a little bit, but can be used to to calm down panic attacks. Because um, one thing uh, anthropologically we did not do when we're about to go into combat was stop breathing. Um, so, again, I don't want to butcher it. I'd have to go back and reread a couple of, couple of um, chapters to before I start quoting this stuff. But there is definitely, and I've, I've tried this even with box breathing. So four seconds in, hold for four, four seconds out, hold for four. The, the hold for four at the bottom is where you start to get panicky if when you, but then when you practice it over time, like that is when it calms you down. Like holding your breath is mm-hmm. when you're like, oh, all right, I'm good now. If there was an actual threat, I'd probably be fucking panic breathing, but I know my brain now responds to the, the four second hold at the bottom is I'm actually not going to die from anything right now. So I'm okay. Yeah. That's a great point, mate. Like you need to condition yourself to. Um, these things in a controlled environment so that you're much better able to deal with these things when when they do come up in an uncontrolled environment Uh, and again it goes back to that progressive overload of of starting with something that's manageable and achievable that you can do consistently day after day for weeks months etc before you then start pushing that and 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 shifting that needle Um, now i want to go back to something you spoke about earlier um, when you're talking about the sources of information because you know this is this is the society that we live in and, you know, yoga, meditation, mindfulness, all that type of stuff. Like for me, I find super valuable and I've told the the story on the podcast numerous times about being in Afghanistan and not being able to sleep and literally just counting my breaths every night before going to bed and that, that helped me wake up in the morning feeling fresh, feeling good, changing my mindset of like, right, I'm fucking in control of this. We're going to fight on our terms. We're going to, you know, we're in control of our situations. And that literally changed my mindset. Um, but I didn't know what I was doing for years. And then Tristan was like, oh, you were actually meditating. I was like, oh, okay, cool. Now I'm going to fucking start implementing that every day. But it was funny because I actually dated a yoga teacher for five years after I got out of the army and she was pushing that stuff on me. And the way that she was presenting it and the way that she was using it, I was like, that shit is not for me. Right. But then I heard it come from Tristan and he used that to help him treat his PTSD, anxiety, depression and dig himself out of that hole and get back into a better place and become a fucking a functioning person within society. And I was like, oh, okay, like that's definitely got some benefits. So I really believe the source of the information is really important. Now, we like to categorize people and put people into boxes. So as you said, Adrian, like if, if you're getting that information from a yogi on Instagram, well, one, you're probably not fucking following that person for <laughs> their yoga and meditation advice. <laughs> Let's be honest, right? But, you know, the, there's, the same thing applies for um, strength training athletes and power uh, Olympic lifters and sprinters and things like that. You know, people um, just put people into boxes and say, well, this person, you know, this is this is this is a myth that still surrounds the fitness industry that pisses me off, man. It's like chicks go, I don't want to lift weights, so I don't want to be big and bulky. And it's like, well, you're not going to be big and bulky. Like I've been lifting for fucking twenty years, trying to get massive, and it hasn't happened, right? <laughs> so, you know, there's definitely benefits. Those chicks that are doing yoga, they should definitely be doing more strength based work. And the guys that are fucking lifting weights all day every day, you know, they definitely need to be doing some more like stretching and mindfulness and you know breath work and things like that. So, you know. Th- if we, if we start looking at the thing that I love about my industry with strength and conditioning is we're now seeing like all of this technology, we've got all this access to this information, we've got all these research um, papers and scientists and subject matter experts coming out and like, you know, talking about the benefits of all of these things. And, you know, we need to open our minds and broaden our horizons and say, well, there must be something to this instead of just fucking, you know, putting it in a box and saying, well, I'm not going to do this mindfulness, meditation, breath work, breath work, whatever, you know, I'm going to figure out a way that I can apply that to my own life and see if I can see the benefits to it. You know, if we look at high level athletes, man, most fucking high level athletes, you know, they have a strength and conditioning coach, they have a nutritionist, they have um, like a, a, a mobility coach, they have um, a soft tissue um, worker or a body worker, or they have a physiotherapist, they have all of these different coaches that are guiding them on all these different areas, 
you know, we need to start taking um, all of these different tools and figuring out ways that we can apply them to our life so that we can be better at life. Yeah, mate, I, I agree. And I, I think where we're at at the moment with um, yoga, chakras, breathing, fucking energy healing, I think we're in the 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 stage where we were at two, three hundred years ago with superstition. And me and Max have talked about this a, a bit on other podcasts. But there's a time where wives' tales, um, superstition, beliefs, are, they're there for a reason, right? And, and, and more often than not, uh, there's something scientific going on. We just are a couple of hundred years before we realize mm-hmm. it. Uh, and, and the example Max used the other day, it's like it used to be bad luck to put your shoes on the table. It used to be bad luck to walk under a ladder. Uh, and, and science minded people back in the day wrote it off going, that's, there's no basis to that. That's superstition. Kind of how most people write off energy and, and, and yoga at the moment. And then we find out a couple of hundred years later that by walking around in shoes all day in a, in a fairly unhygienic environment and putting your shoes on the table generally means you're dropping bacteria in the place where you're about to mm-hmm. eat and you're going to get fucking sick. Walking under a ladder, more nine times out of ten back in the day when no one really gave a shit about workplace health and safety meant that something was going to fall on you, right? It's the same in Thailand. And they just linked it. Oh, my God, correct. (laughs) Uh, And I think think that's where we're at. I think like the the correlation causation argument is that somewhere, someone in history has has come up with an idea and they've preached it as when you breathe this way, it, it makes you healthy. When you get your vibrations in the right. And they've, they've used that and they've gone, all right, I did what they said. I was skeptic. I did what they said. And now I'm healthier. Therefore, their reasoning must be true, um, which is not mm. all, like it just because it correlates doesn't always mean that's what's going on. So I think, I mean, this is just a prediction, but I feel honestly, like I feel like that's where we're going to get to in a couple hundred years. We're going to maybe less, hopefully less. We are going to have scientific backing that shows how energy and vibrations affect the human body. Yeah. And how, I mean, we're already getting there with breathing. We're already, the, the chakra argument, um, I know Tristan says that there is science out at the moment. I haven't seen it, won't, won't debate it either way, but I think we're going to get there. I think that we're going to have scientific proof that woo woo was like superstition back in the day. There was fact to it. They just pitched it the wrong well, way. There's stuff like, mm. uh, what's the, even the, even the social, Talking about what we were talking about before, uh, people have an aversion to mouth breathers. Like, you fucking mouth breathing fuck. Close your m- Why? Where did it come from? And tracing back all of these things. Um, we used to talk about the Indians. They were, used, the Indians used to, they were like, you will die if you breathe out of your mouth. This guy's from his book. He's like, they would actually, mums would teach their newborn babies. They'd gently hold their hands over their mouth to teach them to breathe out of their nose. Like people had an aversion to mouth breathing for for hundreds of thousands of years, uh, and now suddenly we lose all, all these things in life. Like where where are the things that, that we learn in school? We learn how to balance our we, well we we don't even learn how to do tax, but we learn what pi is to sixteen decimal places. Um, but you don't learn some of the holistic things in life that will actually prolong and improve your and make you better at life. And I think maybe going back and learning mm. and looking back at, at the way people used to do it, we, we learned that with food. Food was the first one. How did your grandma used to eat? Vegetable, steak, unprocessed foods. And we fucked that up as we went in high speed. Um, and then mm. we fucked it up. The, the, yeah. There is there is something to say about that, though. Like, obviously, the, the world's population has exploded in the last 70-odd years. Um, and, you know, science, technology has increased uh our ability to sustain ourselves and you know pass on our genes to the next generation and you know that's allowed us to you know science technology has allowed us to hold on to food refrigerate it freeze it um you know create food and have easy access to food all the time like we used to have a problem being able to sustain ourselves and get enough calories in you know, now it's the opposite problem where we've got so much fucking food accessible that, you know, now obesity is a massive problem in, in the, in the world rather than undernourishment. You know, so there's, there's definitely, definitely some positives that have come out of that. But, you know, the point that I want to make here is like going back to what you said about grandma. Um, 
I think 70 years ago, 80 years ago, 90 years ago, something like that, the average intake of sugar was like 18 grams or something like that per day, which is roughly like four and a half teaspoons. Now the average intake of sugar per day is something like 70 to 80 grams, which is like fucking 16, 17, 18 teaspoons of sugar every single day. Now, you know, there's there's a difference between evolution and revolution. Revolution is something that happens over a short period of time. Evolution takes place over fucking long periods of time. And we've evolved in these human bodies that, you know, have taken these slow changes, these slow processes over long periods of time. And we've gone through these revolutions where, you know, the, the agricultural revolution that's allowed humans to, um, live in, you know, larger tribes, larger societies. Then we've gone through the industrial revolution, um, and all that type of stuff where, you know, life is essentially easier, but we're now eating more, we're moving less, and we're living in this, we're still living in the same body. It hasn't had a chance to catch up to the different revolutions that we've gone in, particularly over the last like 100 to 200 years, and in particular, like the last 50 years, man. Uh, well, the, the invention of, exactly, man, the, uh, the industrial revolution and the invention of the light bulb, it's probably done a lot more damage to people's health. Then we realized, like, people just went to fucking sleep at night time. Now we're, you know what I mean? <laughs> now we're staying up till, till, yeah, till 10 o'clock at night, not sleeping. And that's, that's circadian rhythm, man. Like, we are fucking with our own, like, evolutionary biology because we have access to all of these things. So, like you said, when we go back to living like fucking cavemen somewhat, then we're probably, our body is going to, you know, go back to homeostasis a lot easier and it's going to be, you know, a lot better. Our body's going to function as it should be. But, you know, it's, it's, I mean, fuck, nobody wants to go back to living in the dark ages, right? But we need to look at, again, all of these tools that we have, electricity. <laughs> Adrian's like, fuck yeah, I'm on keto, man. I'm in caveman style. <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think we'd fit in a lot better. <laughs> Some people, I think we do pretty well, mate. Our little cohort of knuckle draggers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but the point is, like, you know, everything is a tool. So when once we uh, last time we spoke, Adrian, you spoke about, you know, everything that you look look at is um, evolutionary psychology, evolutionary biology. You know, if we if we take into account how we evolved, and then we start using those principles to live our life. And then using the tools, the technology, the science, the um, medicine and things like that that we have access to, we can allow that to, or we can use that to better our lives rather than fucking um, living like shit and then using that stuff to fix our lives when the, when some, when a problem comes up. 100%, mate. I, th- I think, I mean, medicine, science, it's obviously fantastic. We, we're not um, dying at at, at childbirth anywhere near as rapidly as we were back in the, or in, in the volume that we were back in the day. But realistically, you'd think Darwin would be turning in his grave at the moment watching. It used to be survival of the fittest, right? And that's how evolution mm. improved a species. Um, only the strong survive, the strong mate, uh, and then they make a, a stronger baby or a stronger offspring. And, and it, I mean, even in humans, in most animals, you find um, a, a partner pairing through pheromones that say they're to, their faults in their immune system will be uh, paired with the improvements or, or the opposite opposing faults in mind. Therefore, we will have a healthy kid. These days, we prolong death to the point through drugs, through through machines, through um, scientific advancements, but we prolong death to the point artificially to the point where people aren't dying enough. Um, mm. Unfortunately, it's a hard it's a hard conversation to have. Um, because there's, I think, I think that it, there's some massive. Sorry, but yeah, there's a person to give you. It's not prolonging death, or it is, but it's allowing. And I don't want to get into a eugenics debate, but uh, there is a lady who was so selfish. This was on a sister on sixty minutes. She and her husband had a ninety-seven percent chance of passing on a genetic defect to a kid if they managed to reproduce, and that was that the kid can never eat solid foods. She can't eat solid foods. She has to get forced. She has to get fed through a drip into her stomach. Um, but she wanted to have a kid because that's her God-given right to have a kid. So she said, "They had the kid, and guess what? The kid will never eat solid foods." That's in its fucking life. premeditated um, child abuse, mate. Um, but yeah, a hundred percent. Like we we no longer 
are a society of elite humans. We we cannot call ourselves the tip of the spear. Unfortunately, we are accepting and and almost encouraging unhealthy behavior in every walk of life and fat shaming that's a thing now you're not allowed to do it um if if people have any form of defect i get it like society's better if everyone's nice to each other however there is the real probability that we are uh de-evolving the species um and i mean highly likely we get to the point where technology doesn't even require human uh evolution anymore but that's a whole other topic to discuss um i I think we will within our lifetime maybe one or two generations in the future see massive class divides of people who want to live a survival based lifestyle i.e train hard push themselves grow constantly and there'll be a society of people who are happy with amazon uber eats and fucking netflix and it's all it's, it's comfort versus survival like a lot of like we spoke about last time, everything that I kind of see as, as common sense is, is proven biologically, anthropologically or, or, or whatever. It's, it's, we've evolved to a certain way and that's why it makes sense with science. Um, and the other, the other thing that I always revert back to, which isn't overly smiled upon by a lot of scientific communities, uh, Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Mm. And that is at the, at the base, it is you need to find food and shelter. And that is needs. no longer a challenge. Yeah, biological needs. That's no longer a challenge for everyone. And that is the base of a survival-based organism, and that is what humans are. And that's why we've we've kind of grown to the apex predator top of the food chain that we have. Whereas now, the majority of society is survival is not their motivator. Comfort is. And comfort is, as everyone knows, a slow death. And sitting at home, not going outside, getting everything delivered, you could live your life like the fucking slobs that ride their things in in that Wally movie, riding around in a spaceship. <laughs> everything's on tap, and you get obese and unhappy real quick. Um, so I mean, yeah. it's, a, it's a dark way to look at the future, but I think there, there's a high possibility of a, a segmentation in in humans just based on attitude towards life. Mm. I read something recently that um, the current generation that is being born will be the first generation that does not outlive their or live longer than their parents for the first time in a fucking long time, man. Like that, hearing that, I was like, that's crazy, but it does make sense because we are no longer able. Most people that live in the Western world that, you know, as you said, have everything on tap, they live in this perpetual comfort and then, you know, they don't really face challenges they don't really face many adversities and then when those adversities come up then it fucking hits them hard because they've never faced it before they've never been conditioned to dealing with tough times yeah mate i i got i got kids and that's a fucking scary thought um i mean i I am obviously trying to to encourage my kids to think outside the box that i I do even like what mech said the indians did like i go actively go to my kids and put my hand over their mouth and just see what their response is. Um, cause my oldest kid is always blocked up and, and there's a bunch of reasons why that, we, that we're working on, but he's always full of snot and daycare. Kids are full of fucking sickness, unfortunately, but <laughs> forcing him to breathe through his, through his nose is, is something that I'm definitely going to keep doing because otherwise we'll get, I, I don't want to even think about getting to the point where I'm healthier or outliving my kids. I think that's fucking gross. Mm. Suffering is the peace that allows you to then find happiness in your life. If you have suffered, you have to go through suffering to know what happiness is. And I'm not talking about extreme moments of suffering, but it all comes back to some sort of scale of, so you go field and, you know, you, you sh- like, oh, you do the sniper course or you do selection or you do, you go out bush for six weeks on some Hamill exercise and you're eating ration packs you might have made a salami stick last for six <laughs> weeks and you're sleeping on rocks and not sl- – you get back and you're like, I just want to have McDonald's and have a coat. Like, I don't know, whatever the simple luxuries and sleep in a bed and have a shower. And that's the best fucking thing on the planet. And you're so happy when it's done. And then you always have a – and I'm not saying – it's almost stoi- stoicism. Like, it, things could be – things are bad now, but they could have been worse or – Oh, that is bad, and now I'm happy. And, and I think suffering is is a, a way that 
that's what people are, are, are really buying into now with um, hunting their own food or going out and they're hurting themselves in the day and then feeling good afterwards. Mm-hmm. I think that that's something that people are going to try and hold on to. Outside of the basic primal things, um, I have been doing, like since this transition, in this transition space, I have been fucking regimentally getting up at 10 past four, training, walking. I'm doing everything right. I've been strict keto, dropped about seven kilos. I'm fuck doing every single thing right. The one thing I'm not doing is I, I get fuck all sunlight. Um, because I've outfalled my windows up for, for the mm. studio and I fucking see nobody outside of my missus in the day and I'm fucking going mental, mm. mate. And so you see all these things that are that are primal um, tribe routine identity, all these things. You, it has to be a holistic mm-hmm. model. And that's why the Better at Life and Swiss Aid, giving these tools to people that should be free, that are just prolonging people's fucking life and improving people's, um, mental state. We talk about the veteran veteran suicide rates are high. Yes, they fucking are. But everyone's killing themselves. Miners, emergency workers, um, vets, veterinarians are killing themselves at fucking record numbers. Like the the mental health crisis is a Western epidemic, and creating this thing and having guys like you on board who are just like fucking invested in your people and is massive for me and it's a trust thing. I think the trust is a big one in everything we're doing and talking about these principles. Um, like there's a dude on Facebook that's saying he's got a new marketing workout and it's it's proven, it's scientifically proven that uh, if you can get up without using your hands, you'll live mm-hmm. longer. I'm like, yeah, fucking probably because you're not a big fucking fat piece of shit. Mm-hmm. Like <laughs> we're not looking at this. And people then will put marketing behind it. But when you're trying to give people stuff for free, which is what we're doing at Swiss Aid and what, you know, you're helping us do, I think that's where we build the trust and we sort of make a difference, mate. Yeah, man. Sorry, that was a rant. That was good. (laughs) (laughs) Love a good rant. I love it. Mate, session done. No. (laughs) Um, Mate, (laughs) mate, I want to go back to what you just said then. Like, you're doing everything right in your mind where you're getting up, you're training, you're blah, 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 eating healthy. Da, 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 da. Okay. But then, you know, we need to look at the wheel of life and you're, you just said you're not getting enough sunshine and you're not seeing any friends. You don't have that sense of community and that sense of tribe. So, you know, yes, you might be ticking the boxes in all of these areas and you might be dedicating your time, energy and effort to, you know, those areas at a fucking 10 out of 10. But then you've also dropped off in other areas. So sometimes it's worth like, you know, dropping a couple of pegs in some areas so that you can invest that time, energy, and effort into other areas so you can get a little bit more sunshine. You can invest more time in, you know, building your friendship network and um, building your own tribe up there and things like that. So, you know, I think that's a great point is like, you know, we need life is all about fucking balance, man. And, you know, whilst you've gone through this period, I'm not sure how long you've been doing that for, but let's say you've been doing it for a couple of months and other areas of your life have taken a little bit of a hit. It might be worth going, all right, cool. I've built the discipline. I've built um, the standards, the standard operating procedures that I want in those areas of my life. I know how those tools make me feel. Now I'm going to take a little bit of time, energy and effort away from that. I'm going to refocus that those resources over in this direction. I'm going to build out my tribe. I'm going to build out um, a little bit of a routine that includes getting out, getting some sunshine, getting a little bit of movement, um, et cetera, et cetera, and see how that affects me. And then you're constantly like retweaking, readjusting those jigsaw puzzle pieces and fitting it together the best way that's going to suit your life. And, you know, it's it's about prioritizing things. You're not going to fucking find the best regime, the best regiment that's going to work perfect for you every single day. It's just, again, it's taking those principles and going, all right, well, I know, um, you know, I haven't been getting enough sunshine. I need to get a little bit more of that. That means I'm going to be taking away from some of these other areas. And it's constantly tweaking, refining, adjusting, understanding those principles and applying the right dosage at the right time. And, and the education, the edu- education is the key to everything. Obviously, like if Max was sitting there hypothetically, I mean, he's lucky that he understands like a lo- where all the pieces of the puzzle like fit together. And I think it is okay. Like if you understand, I'm not claiming we understand everything, but if you understand where the pieces are and you're like, all right, to achieve goal X, I need to sacrifice two parts of the puzzle for the next 
three months, whatever mm-hmm. it's going to be. Um, that's still acceptable. Like if just imagine for a second though, someone's like Max sitting in Darwin in a dark room doing a bunch of stuff in a computer all day and going, Oh, I've been told that if I go and train in the morning and I, I eat properly, then it's going to sort out my mental health problems or it's, it's going to keep me healthy and happy. And then you go away and you, you eat properly, you train hard in the morning and you go and sit in a dark room all day and don't speak to your mates for three months and you're depressed as fuck, right? And you're sitting there going, I don't get what's going on. That is the biggest problem, I think. Lack of education. Yeah, this is fucking bullshit. This doesn't fucking yeah. work. <laughs> I'm just going to go back to the pub. <laughs> yeah. Right? Because the pub, obviously, is the, the quick fix. I mean, the, the whole suffering argument, couldn't agree more. That is mm. almost the purpose. of The meaning of life for mine is how you monitor and manage your suffering. Mm. Um and that is it, like going to the pub, short-term suffering equals long-term gain, long-term suffering, um, short-term gain. Sorry, v- vice versa. No, that way, but the other way around. So short-term suffering often leads to long-term gains. Um, short-term positives, short-term fun, exciting things often lead to long-term pain and suffering. That's and short-term that is where you gratification. Go on- Correct. So I'm down and out. I feel like shit. What am I going to do? I know last time I smashed six beers really quickly, it made me happy. So you go and do that and then you get a hangover and you feel like fucking shit for two days later. So what do you do? You have no other tools. You don't, you don't have any other education. Last time I was on the piss, I felt really good. So I'll go and do that and it just becomes a, a cycle. Mm-hmm. Whereas you put in the hard yards, um, suffer. Fitness is, is hard for that reason. It is short term suffering. Smash yourself in the gym for an hour. You are going to feel good for the rest of the day. Um, no brainer. And that's, that's, but the education piece is, is key to the whole thing. Um, understanding everybody on the planet feels anxious and depressed at some time. Um, and if you don't, I know it's, it's, no one likes to hear 100% straight up facts, but, um, if you don't, chances are that you just, you're feeling certain ways, but you're just not sure what that, what word labels that feeling at the time. Cause anxiety and depression is a part of life. It's how long we're stuck in those states um, that that kind of is the problem. Um, Short term, anxiety is a a fantastic tool if you know how to play with it properly. Depression, Mm -hmm. not so fun. But um, yeah, it's it's knowing when those feelings come along, what are the areas of life that you need to tweak to get back to a state that makes you feel better. Uh, And and with Max, he knows, everyone knows, get the fuck out of Darwin, hang out with the boys more and you're going to be happier. (laughs) Absolutely, mate. But I think it's that it's that education and knowing, and and for me that it it it's okay because I know where I think I know where I'm going wrong. Uh, and for me at the moment, I just I have a goal that I'm trying to hit, and so outside of that, I mean, yeah, I can go and fucking have sunshine for an hour and go and sun. It's fucking Darwin. Um, that's making excuses, but but just so we could sort of propose the problem. Uh, I think education and having a responsibility to people to constantly adapt and change and not being doctrinal in like, no, no, these are the eight principles and, and we won't learn. Like we change with fitness. We had, we, we used to be fitness was one of our pillars and we changed that to movement. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah, fitness isn't your mental. It's, you've just got to move your body and you're going to get fitness doing mm-hmm. whatever, but constantly being to strive and to change and to adapt and learn new things and, and experience it before you preach it. Uh, and I think just, you know, not being, not being a sellout would be, would be somewhat that I'm sort of pretty happy about where we're going. Yeah. Um, before I dive into where you guys are at with Swiss 8 and what you, what the projects you're working on and things like that. Um, I do want to say, I want to kind of tie all that in. You know, sometimes you do need to make these sacrifices. And I know that both of you boys have been fucking under the pump for the last couple of years trying to, you know, particularly this time last year when the world went into lockdown, you guys were just head down, ass up, just like getting as much work as you could done, could could get done to push this app out to everyone so that everyone had these tools to be able to, you know, manage their fucking day to day, manage their life so they could be better at life. Um, but going back to that, like everything is sacrifice. Max, you're... You're up in Darwin, you're under the pump, you've got things that you're working towards, so you're sacrificing certain areas, certain elements of your life because you really want to focus on specific things. Now, 
sacrifice. That sacrifice is absolutely necessary, okay, but it can't be like that long term. There needs to become a point where you go, all right, I need to go back the other way a little bit. I need to spend a little bit more time where, you know, maybe I'm not working so hard and I am spending some time with friends and family and, you know, switching off a little bit and, and, and sharpening the axe. You know, I'm constantly talking about on this podcast about, um, you know, taking those pillars and then prioritizing them depending on what's going on in my life. So, an, an example of this is, you know, for the most part, um, every single day, I'm always working on personal growth. I'm always working on my fitness. Um, sleep's obviously a big one every single day, okay? But when I go um, about six, five or six months ago, I drove around Thailand took my car and drove around Thailand for like three months, uh, three weeks. I was like, well, I can't travel overseas. I'll buy a car. I'll just fucking drive around. It covered like five and a half thousand kilometers in, in three weeks, right? So, you know, I didn't do any training then. Um, my sleep was off. Um, I wasn't eating as well as I normally did because I was fucking out of these random places in the middle of Thailand, man. I, I literally like walked into, there was probably like three or four days where I was in these like, places off the beaten path where I can count on one hand how many foreigners I saw in those places over a couple of days. And, you know, I, I walked into a couple of restaurants. They didn't speak any English. They didn't have any English um, menus. They didn't have any photos or anything like that. And the limited tie that I had, I couldn't order anything. And I literally had to like get up and walk out of those restaurants because they couldn't understand me. I couldn't understand them, right? But the point that I'm making is that, you know, the things that I prioritize when I am at my home environment were not the same things that I could prioritize when I was traveling, okay, because my priorities had changed. It was no longer about my routine and, you know, setting my day up to be the best that I could be every single day. I was traveling and I wanted to see as much as I could. I wanted to cover as much ground as I could. And that meant that my sleep patterns were off and I was, you know, rolling into places late and, you know, eating food wherever I could on the fly. And I was getting up early to go and watch sunsets and things like that. So, you know, those tools are there to be fucking applied at the appropriate time. And that's the point that I'm trying to make is like, you need to have a look at all of those tools and then figure out what's the most um, important for you at that time and then start switching them around and adjusting them. And, you know, those, those principles aren't set in place. You take those principles and you use those principles and you understand what those principles are. And then you switch everything around and you make it work for you. Oh, yeah, 100%. Mate, that, absolutely. And the word, I mean, you were, you were using, um, the word sacrifice a, a bit. Like uh, what, what Max is, is essentially doing now is sacrificing X, um, cause he's got goals he wants to achieve and they require to be inside a lot, getting work done. I think, I think that's the issue. Like sacrifice and suffering in this context, almost the same definition, right? So mm. if you go, I'm going to sacrifice, and this is what the, I think this is a big problem in the, in the Western world is that especially in the, the corporate space, we go, I'm going to sacrifice X amount of time because it means a lot. I'm going to get a long-term gain. Like I'm going to suffer for a year because it means I'm going to get this done in life. Unfortunately, as we talked about earlier with, with suffering versus reward, if you let the suffering go on for too long, it becomes chronic and then the reward never comes. Uh, and that's mm -hmm. what we do. We go, if I, if you're not aware and you're not conscious of it and you're not educated on what is going to happen, you'll go, I'm going to sacrifice the next two months. Uh, because I need to get this done and, and then that's going to make X, Y, Z better. And then two months comes and you're like, if I just do another two months, then we, we, or in, in the corporate space, I'm going to sacrifice two years. I'm not going to see my kids. I'm going to work my guts off. FIFO as well, like fucking yeah. massive problem for FIFO. Yeah. A lot of the guys are like, I'm going to sacrifice two years of my life. I'm going to make a shitload of money. And then the reward's going to be fantastic. And then that two years turns into four, six, eight, ten. You are now in a chronic state of sacrifice and suffering. And then life seems shit. You don't know why. Wheels fall off. Suicidal. Um, mm. and that's, that's not a, a false leap. That is happening. Like the, the suicide rates in the mining and construction industry are phenomenal. Um, and I, I mean, I, I think there's some crossover there. I think there's some crossover in, in the veteran space is, is we go, right, life shitty at the moment. Um, I'm going to just drink piss for a bit and eat poorly, but I'm going to, oh, I mean, not just veterans, health and, and, and fitness industry too. I'm, I'm going to just, I'm going to binge for a bit and then I'm going to get in shape at, at X time. And then that time stretches out and 10 years later, you've been obese for the, your entire life and you hate everything. Um, I, so I think that, that's the piece that people need to manage is, is to go, Yes, sacrifice is looked at as a cool thing. You sacrifice this for this, 
But if, if the reward never comes, you are in a chronic state of suffering and your life is not going to be fun. Mm. Mm. But That's even, point, even, man. so go on, Max. Going on your adventure, right? So your life is like you are, you're at the peak of your industry, mate, and your routine and you know, you have the tools, you can relax and go on a holiday and have an adventure knowing full well that I can turn this back on immediately and that. I can be guilt free mm-hmm. in any like I might I can have that extra fucking sausage roll or whatever you know I can mm-hmm. be guilt free having a beer I don't know what the fuck it is but I can do <laughs> that because I know that I can turn it around and fuck it I, my ninety five percent of my life is good um, this is my holiday and I'm going to enjoy it mm-hmm. that's a great point and it is that mindset man um, I spoke to Luke Richmond on the podcast I interviewed him and he's an ex army guy. Um, got out, um, basically fucking was getting hosed down in the cells in London, covered in his own shit, um, was taking drugs and blah, 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 and just decided right there and then to turn his life around, flew to Thailand, trained at Tiger Muay Thai, and like now he's this fucking badass adventurer that's written two books, like awesome fucking dude, right? But, you know, it, it, he talked about that sacrifice and he talked about that mindset and that mentality, and that's what you need to do sometimes. You need to make that fucking decision and, set yourself those goals he um after uh after he came to thailand he went back to australia and started working with working in the mines and he's like all right i want to write a book i want to start leading this life that i can be proud of that i can talk to my kids about and i can look back on and be like fuck man i achieved a lot of things in my life and the way that he set himself up to do that was by working in the mines and he's like all right well i'm going to give myself a year i'm going to work i'm going to sacrifice I'm going to fly in. I'm going to fly out. I'm going to, everything else is going to be fucking left on the table. My main priority is to make as much money as I can in the next year so that I can set myself up and go and live this life that I want, right? And, you know, he said that a lot of people that he met that were in the mines are like exactly the same. I'm going to do this for two years. I'm going to save up. I'm going to buy a house. But then they get caught up in that lifestyle. They get caught up in making that money and that, and, you know, relying upon that. That, as Adrian said, they go on to, all right, well, if I just do this for another two years, then I'll get this. If I do this for another two years, then I'll get this. And he made that decision. He drew that fucking line in the sand and he's like, I'm doing this for a year. I'm going to get as much money as I can. My goal is to make as much money as I can, sac- at, you know, sacrifice everything else so that I can go and lead this life. And I think that's an important point is, is you know, when you do make that sacrifice, you need to set a goal you need to set an end point as well where you're going to stop that sacrifice and you're going to balance everything out again um something i spoke about with paul as well i i um had an interview with paul from head up charity um who was a, a great guy um i'm not sure if this will be this will probably drop after his episode i think but um anyway what he said in the um in that interview was when he was diagnosed with PTSD, he got out of the army. He again made that he was like spent months in fucking bed. He couldn't move. Like he was, it was his PTSD was crippling. And, you know, he would go and do something and then his, his brain would just go fucking nuts and he would go back to bed because he couldn't deal with it. And he was like, when I decided to change my life, and then he went on to this massive spill and I was like, boom, I came back to that and I was like, Something really powerful you just said then was when I decided. And what he actually did was he sacrificed his lifestyle that he had been living. He was like, I'm good mates with Simon, but I can't see him. I can't see those boys. I can't see the guys that I associate going out on the piss with and doing all these things with because I need to fucking sacrifice that to focus on my own health. And I think that's an important thing is like your environment plays a massive part in um, how you're going to move the needle in the right direction. And if you're in the wrong environment, then sometimes you need to sacrifice that environment. And the environment's not just where you live. It's the people you hang out with. It's the music you listen to, the podcast. It's everything that you fucking consume. You know, so sometimes you need to sacrifice that environment, put yourself in a better position to then move in the right direction. And he was like, I started doing, you know, meditation, journaling, um, training, focusing on nutrition, sleep, basically all of the Swiss A principles. And he goes, I didn't see any of the boys for eight months time. But then once I got into a place where I knew I had the tools to be able to use 
to get myself back into a good place. If I did fall off the wagon and start going down that hill again, then, you know, then he goes, I called the boys back up. I'm like, hey, lads, let's go out and have a drink. I'm sorry I haven't seen you guys for eight months, but I've had to focus on myself and blah, blah, blah. And the boys were just like, we understand, man. We're fucking, we're, we're glad that, you know, you, you spent that time to work on yourself and we're also really fucking happy to see you again. We'd prefer you do that than never fucking see you again. 100%, mate. Hundred percent. Let's go. Fuck. The uh, yeah. I think it's the power um, of decision is is the big one, and and we I spoke. People don't know how to make a fucking decision anymore, or they need to wait till they're at rock bottom to make that decision and and have that catholic moment. And sometimes you never make that decision, and that will lead to some pretty fucking uh, untoward set of circumstances, suicide stuff like this some people Mm -hmm. don't ever have that catholic moment and go fuck i need to sort my life out um some people don't have that catholic moment until they're already jumping off like that guy who jumped off the golden gate bridge uh and he got halfway down and he went fuck i don't want to die and he lived most people don't He hit the water he woke up and it's his big story and it's he's quite famous he does a lot of a lot of keynote speeches and he's like my Catholic moment was halfway down from the Golden Gate Bridge going, I don't want to fucking Fuck. die. That's yep. a story, right? That's a story. <laughs> you know <what> I mean? <laughs> and, but I mean, that uh, is, so that's, the, that's the metaphor. I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't know, but I, I would assume that the, the term hit rock bottom comes from digging holes. You dig holes in dirt until you hit bedrock, right? And most people hit rock bottom and they're like, they've got two options. It's like get out of the hole or fucking pull the pin. And if you dig in too deep and you don't have the tools to get out, the easy option is going to be to pull the pin. So we've got to find a way to get people to make that left, right a choice. I'm going to get better. I'm going to keep getting worse before they're at the bottom of the hole. Mm. Well, yeah, give them the tools. It's giving people the tools early in life where they might pay them off, where you, you know, you're sitting at school and you're getting sex ed. Right, and they're like, "Oh yeah, put a condom on. That's where the vagina is cool." But later on, you're like, "Ah, that was fucking handy." <laughs> uh, <laughs> at school, when you yeah, learn true. these things, and you're starting to Max ain't got no babies. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I'm putting it in the wrong. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> but, <laughs> but yeah, we get you get these yeah. tools to to people, and and uh, we can start parking ambulances at the top of cliffs instead of at the bottom for for ones. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the tool, tools are the ed- and the education. I mean, education is the tools. That's the the big chunk. The second big chunk, and this is a whole other podcast, so we won't go into it too deep. The second big chunk is is ownership, right? So you can have all the tools in the world. If you blame everyone else around you, you're not going to fucking use a single one of them because you expect you're in a hole. You expect everyone else to pull you out. And like we are a a mental health charity, we are well aware that pulling people out of holes is something that's needed at certain times. But if you're sitting there going through life going, it's everyone else's fault. I've been taught this stuff, but I'm going to pay it off because everybody else around me needs to fix shit for me or fix the world. You are fucked. Um, you can teach, if you have that mentality, you can teach that person every tool in the world. You can lead them to the biggest bucket of water ever. They are not going to drink it. They need someone else to drink it for them too. And that is the fucking wrong mindset. And before I go too far down a rant, like I, I always bring back to this because education is massive. But owning your own situation, I mean, every person who, not everyone, most of the people who I respect in life, that is, that is fundamental to their philosophy. Like Jordan Peterson's huge on it. Jocko Willink wrote a book, Extreme Ownership. Um, Aubrey Marcus, I still like a lot of his stuff. He, he gets a bit woo-woo at, at the moment, but he wrote a book called Own the Day. And it, it's all about owning your own fucking life. Um, I think that that comfort conversation we had earlier, like everybody at the moment in the comfort space wants everything to be easy. And if it's not, it's someone else's fault. And that all the tools in the world can't solve that. The only thing that can solve that is that person taking ownership for themselves. And that obviously we get deep into because it reverts back to blaming governments, blaming other people, blaming defense, um, blaming the war. You can blame all day. That's not going to solve your problem. All it's going to do is make you angrier. You you need mm. to own your own fucking path forward. Mm. I want to tie that back into what Max said earlier about making a decision about oh mate fucking halfway down from the Golden Gate Bridge and decided that he was didn't want to die. He wasn't ready for that and he wanted wanted to continue living. Like if you don't make it, if you choose not to use these tools, that is a decision in itself. 
not making a decision is a fucking decision in itself. So everything in life is a decision. Everything is sacrifice. So if you're saying yes to some things, you're saying no to many others. So we need to prioritize what we're going to say yes to. And that requires making a decision. And sometimes those fucking decisions are hard to make. And this is where a lot of people get caught up is they, you know, well, it's too hard to weigh up all the cost, benefit, um, you know, reward ratios, et cetera, et cetera. It's like, you know, if you don't make a decision and you don't want to change anything, that's making a decision that you're not going to change and you're going to continue going down that path. And that goes both ways, whether you're walking up the hill or you're walking down the hill, you need to make that decision of, right, if I'm walking down the hill and fucking I'm spiraling out of control, I need to make a decision to stop doing the things that are sabotaging me that is allowing me to roll down that hill. I need to put the handbrake on. I need to fucking turn around. I need to make the decision to start doing the things that are going to help me move back in the right direction and, again, shift that needle towards the direction that I want to be moving in. You're dead right, mate. I mean, it's it's the power of decision-making is something that is completely lost now. Otherwise, if you don't make... We're not talking about, I kind of want to quit smoking. I kind of want to quit drinking. You're wishful thinking. You're, you're dreaming. I want to, I want to, I want to be a millionaire one day. Yeah. Fuck. So do I. Um, <laughs> that is wishful thinking and dreaming. I had a dream last night. I was a millionaire. You make a decision and then you implement steps to do it without a plan forward. And then that starts to become a reality. And your first step, even to fitness, mate, like guys sitting at home, like not at the peak of their performance, but people who are just sitting at home going like, how the fuck am I going to do it? I'm like, just put your fucking sneakers on, put your runners mm-hmm. on. Put them on. You might not make it out the fucking door, but just every wake up and put them on. And then the next day, get to the fucking letterbox. And that's your first step, mate. And then make mm-hmm. a cult and make a habit out of it. And there's so many tools that we can use to generate positive habit forming. But make the fucking decision. And, and that is what am I going to have to get rid of to make this decision? And what do I really want out of my life? Yeah, 100%, man. Mate, that's awesome. That's a great transition into what I want to go into next. Um, you guys have been pushing out a lot of, um, a lot of programs for the app, uh, like run across a nullabore and, uh, that type of stuff. Can you speak to my audience about, uh, some of these different challenges that you're putting up on the app and, uh, what the goal is with those? Um, and, you know, how you're kind of building that community and getting a little bit of hype behind what you're doing? Yeah. I mean, the, the challenge is something that, that we, well, I mean, to, to take a step back, we originally all of our content was video based. Um, I do love video content, but there is a, a, a large cost to video content. We're a fairly low budget charity. Um, and there's also a, a long time, uh, involved in shooting, editing, planning, all that kind of stuff with videos. And we, we built the app to accommodate both video, um, written copy, images, everything, and still look sexy. So we got to the point where we're like, Hey, there's, there's a lot of, programs that we have in the pipeline that are going to be six months down the track to get high quality video content whereas people can get value from them today if we just put them out with with stills and 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 written stuff and a lot of as at the moment a lot of that was around challenges um well we're very conscious of not being gimmicky in marketing and and the, the things that we do um but we also have to meet the market halfway and get them to take like max said that first step to the letterbox like we would never mm. preach to someone, hey, if you want to get really fit, you should just put sneakers on and walk to your letterbox every day. That doesn't seem like the correct um, prescription. However, you've got to meet people where they're at and then slowly take them on a journey. And challenges are a great way to get people excited about fitness in a small way and then obviously build it and build it and build it. And, and the term challenge itself means you're stepping out of your comfort zone. So... Um, we're a digital organization. We, we can't at the moment through COVID get people to go to Kokoda, uh, which is a very Australian military based tradition around fitness and, and challenging yourself with a bit of military history. And we can't get people climbing Everest. We can't get people into England to swim the channel, a whole bunch of stuff, but we can do it virtually. So we build a bunch of virtual challenges for the app. There's heaps more coming up. We're going to slow release them. Uh, and though the intent behind those is to get people excited about their fitness journey, uh, to get them started. Uh, and, and obviously the, the, there's a new team function to the app. So we, we've just released, you can add a team. You, it's, it's all gamified now. You score, earn points for everything you do. 
Um, those points convert over time into climbing ranks like a video game, but they also convert to real world rewards. So at the moment, they're all just Swiss 8 merch discounts, but down the track, obviously, they'll convert to anything that we have access to with in our partnership network to, to sell. And the goal, the idea is you, you get people, give people any incentive you can to get involved in life in a bigger way. Um, and if that blurs the boundaries between being a little bit gimmicky as far as challenge marketing, giving people free stuff to who gives a fuck if it, if that's what it needs to get them started, then, then let's get them started. Um, I, I guarantee once you do all these programs for, for six months, the motivation will not be to get 20 bucks off your next shirt. It will be because you love how you feel and how your life's kind of progressing. Uh, so that's mm. where we're at. We, we've got a lot of new programming coming up. Um, shooting stuff, a lot of meditation, sleep, binaural beat stuff that'll be out in the next few weeks. Um, there's a few bigger projects. We can't go into all of them. Our, our big focus this year is, uh, re- it's, it's heavily research back. We've got a study on at the moment. Uh, in partnership with Newcastle Uni, uh, for anyone who is, I know you've got an international audience at the moment. We're just recruiting Australian military veterans. Um, if you've transitioned out any time from 1990, I think it is onwards, um, swiss8.org slash research. You can sign up for the trial. It's, it's in its simplest form. It is using the app for eight weeks and tracking your mood every day. Um, and there's a bunch of finer details that the, the psych researcher at Newcastle Uni will go into when you register, but, that's a big focus at the moment. And then later in the year, we have another research partnership, which is a little bit classified at the moment. Um, we're, we're building a, a tech product that will change the face of mental health across the planet. Um, it, it's, it's using algorithms, machine learning, um, a bunch of data points that'll be funneling in through the app to, I don't know. Tell me, am I allowed to talk? Yeah, it's fuck. just going to be. It'll be. It's going to be really good. Watch this space. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right. Well yeah, said, good. mate. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Um, so, what's the what's the vision for Swiss Eight over the next couple of years? Like, what's the what's the direction you guys are moving in? Uh, I mean, our our end state is to build tech products that that allow people to live life without. Uh, falling into fucking pits of depression and anxiety. Um, we are well on the way to, to, to being a big player in that space. And that is our goal. Three year goal is to get this research, this tech based research done, get it out to everybody, uh, around Australia, our veteran community first. I mean, the app itself is open to the public now. Um, and then eventually to the world. Um, and that, that will become the, the, the foundation of, of what Swiss Aid is. And then, Mex's big focus at the moment is is coordinating a lot of the events because, and I'll let Mex go into more detail. But there is in the in the tech space, like everyone's tried it: Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Social networking was originally designed to connect people in the digital age. Unfortunately, without in person physical connection, we are fucked. I mean, it's 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 made the world worse. Realistically. Connecting the world digitally has disconnected everyone physically. So we, we're mm-hmm. acutely aware of that. Everything we're building in the tech space needs to be followed up with phase two of how do we get people connected uh, physically? How do we get them outdoors, living life through these principles? Personal growth is a massive one. And that's what a lot of these events are going to be based around is, is finding ways to get people together, doing shit that they've never done before, learning new, finding new hobbies, learning new skills. And and the the object is is not to create another ESO for a activity. We, yeah, veterans are they're like people. They're like fingerprints. They're all different. And the three and a half thousand ESOs would continue to balloon to the how many millions of people on the planet because everybody's mm-hmm. different and they like to integrate and do things slightly differently. Using events where instead of doing that, bringing people together digitally. Bring them together in a in a construct where they can form new circles, learn new skills, and build a new tribe around something that they are interested in. So we got the Fink Desert Race, which is motocross, uh, a big enduro race for two days. Getting veterans who are ex vehicle mechanics to come and be the vehicle mechanics. Getting ex cooks, like get the army cooks in. Like come on, mate, you're cooking dinner. Get the boys yeah. in. Anyone that's that's really focused on, they love motorbikes and stuff like that. Bang, we're going to do an event for that. The next, like, we got a Sydney to Hobart. 
people who like sailing, we're going to teach them to sail um, properly, rig a boat. There's going to be a pretty, we're, we're finalizing it all, but we've got some spots uh, in the Sydney to Hobart on one of the boats and we'll, um, it'll be a month long lead up training. So these guys are going to have to get selected to come and jump on uh, and, and be on one of the boats for the Sydney to Hobart. Stuff like this where we can build a tribe and get people out. They're digitally connected. We can keep them together. And they can build a new community and, and find a new identity outside of defense. That it's not mm. that's not weird. Um <laughs> not forced. It's not forced and it's not these weird like, hey, we're gonna do I, I like I don't wanna like is it, fuck it, like it's not like painting for therapy or something. It's like where boys are like, I'm not gonna fucking sure there might be an option, but it's it's activities where people are like, hang on, that kind of looks like a bit of fun, like you're dead right, and that's what we're trying and to get. Challenging, boys. yep, and challenging, challenging as well, man. It's got to be challenging. Yep. You got to be. Able to, I mean, the, the the big, the exciting part is that we're not doing all this in isolation either. We're, the collaboration between other ex-service organisations and charities is is high on our kind of radar. We don't. There is a big problem, especially in Australia. I'm not sure what it's like in other countries, but um, the broken veteran story came about because there's too many ex-service organisations and they all compete for what they think is a small funding pool and therefore they've got to tell the story to the world that veterans are broken, give us more money. Created infighting, creates, ESAs all hate each other and that is a big fucking problem. Um, mm-hmm. So us working with other organisations, RSL for example, um, me and Swebsy and a few of the boys are members of the local RSL as well. That's an ex-service organisation with organisation that we're trying to bring together to to be part of these events um whether or not the fink i'm not sure but definitely with the sailing stuff and then internationally i mean the boys from heads up and um fighting minds i mean that it, it's not across the line yet but collaborating with other ex-service organizations i think is a fucking that is the model that we have to adopt um mm-hmm. we can't everyone from the military has some form of hero complex buried away in their psyche somewhere everyone wants to save the world uh, there's a lot of people out there now spruiking the or, or pretending they've got all the answers to everything and, and they just realistically want to be the face that everyone looks at and goes, hey, they solved all the problems. That's not how it works. The only way forward in this in this entire, um, the only way to solve this problem is by organizations working together, sharing information, building products together that fucking solve problems. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's mm-hmm. a big part of our, our vision and future. And mate, this isn't bespoke to veterans. This isn't a veteran problem. This, these, are, these are all problems that society. We, I think veterans have had the lion's share of exposure to suicide. Yes, the, the numbers are high. I'm not disagreeing with that, but I think these same principles are for society. And without we, you, you could do this podcast and drop off the veteran piece, and it's completely palatable and makes perfect sense to any person any demographic on the planet the principles Mm -hmm. don't change because you went in the army because you wore one uniform or the other um Mm -hmm. i think they were just polarized and and exacerbated you know leaving the military you know your your mateship and your tribe and stuff like that is is probably more so but there's other areas i think it's it's got utility across every aspect and field of life Mm. Absolutely, mate. And I like what you said before about the the cooperation between the different organizations. I think that is super important, man. And it's fucking critical because, you know, no one organization can cover all of the bases. You know, again, everything is a tool. And, you know, instead of investing your time, energy and effort into covering specific topics and certain things, someone else is already fucking doing that. Just work with them to, you know, push that over line and help. We should be complementing each other. All of these different veteran organizations should be complementing each other. And we're all working towards the same thing. Like, you know, both you boys have been in Afghanistan. You know what it's like? You know, everyone has a role. You've got your fucking infantry soldiers. You've got your snipers. You've got your engineers. You've got your mortars. You've got your signalers. You've got your cavalrymen. You've got, you know, all of these different roles, all of these different responsibilities. And everyone brings something to the table and together, they work as a fucking team to achieve the mission. I think that's absolutely critical and something that has been missing, unfortunately, in the in the veteran space. And and this is why I'm really happy to be working with you guys because you guys think like that as well. And you know, uh, I've been asked to be involved with a couple of other organisations as well. And um, you know, I see all the infighting and I see um, everyone's kind of going up against each other and butting heads and you know, trash talking other organisations and shit like that. And I just don't want to fucking be a part of that. I want to be a part of the veteran community that are working 
working together to fucking solve these problems that not only veterans are going through, but the wider community as well. 100%, mate. And I think that is, is, is fairly similar across our circle of mates. Um, no one's really got time to, to get in the fucking mud fights and, and to throw shit at each other. I mean, we, we've had our, there's, there's certain politicians out there that don't like, that don't really like our attitude towards, um, life and things and, and, and people, there is other organizations that throw mud. And I, I think, especially with social media these days, it's so easy to get caught in the, Hey, I'm going to spend today responding to all this shit or, I could spend today focusing on the projects that I've been working on for the last fucking five years. And I think that's where we're going to stick to it. And that is the mentality of yourself, all of our mates. It's like, if we want to achieve big things, then we're going to cop some haters. But I don't have a minute of my fucking life to waste fighting that shit. So, and if, if people listen to the hate and they judge us, we have, we've lost fans and followers for, through some of the mud that's been thrown, but. They'll come back eventually, and if they don't, who gives a fuck, mate? Like, there's bigger, bigger problems to solve than than um, answering hate mail. Yeah. yeah, yeah. If you try and keep everyone happy, you're not going to please anyone. Please no one. Like, mate. You just, 100%. You just got to, you just got to do your own thing, mate. And the people that are on board, the people, the people that are part of your fucking tribe, they'll become loyal followers, man. They'll become fucking loyal to the tribe, and they're going to be pushing that message out to anyone who will listen. You know, and that's that's a that's a big thing for me, man. Um, love this conversation, lads. Uh, is there if if people want to get behind Swiss Eight uh, and throw some sponsorship money your way and and help you guys get uh, these different programs and uh, different projects off the ground, where can they find uh, you guys and how can they donate? Um, Swiss Eight dot org is our website. Uh, there's a few sublinks that you can go to. I mean, there's. Uh, the, the Fink race is the one that we're raising money for now is to get this team of veterans to, to the Fink, um, which is one of the projects or just the general donation portal, uh, which every, uh, 120 bucks we raise will fund a, an app user for a year. And that's kind of the, the goal, the, the baseline goal for us is to keep, uh, everybody, uh, using the app for free, um, forever. Uh, and then, Obviously, Swiss.8 on, on Instagram, all of our socials are around Swiss8. And then Instruction Sold Separately is our podcast, uh, which, which you've been on yourself, um, which the organization is very professional. The podcast also professional. It's got a different name so that we can <laughs> be fucking real. Like we, um, we, we can get a little bit looser and, and, and talk the way that veterans do and, and kind of be ourselves and, and Instruction Sold Separately kind of is the place to go yeah. if you want to hear the real talk. It's, yeah, it's like sure. it's my the weekly real- therapy session, mate. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> ha- mate, hundred percent, hundred percent. And uh, like I said, I'm, I'm uh, Mo's episode is going to be out by the time I drop this one, but I'm definitely going to have an introduction to that. Hey, course language here. If you get offended easily, you probably shouldn't be listening to this one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, same for no, you. Yeah. It. Yeah. Yeah. It's all good. No. Um, that's, that's the comment that comes in a lot as well as like, Hey, great content, but you fucking swear a lot. <laughs> like, well, that's who I am. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Sorry. No. Yeah. Awesome yeah. boys. It's been an absolute pleasure having a chat to you. Uh, and, uh, I wanted to get you guys on. So, um, my audience could hear, uh, the faces behind, um, the organization that I'm putting my name to. Um, and it's an, it's an absolute honor for me to be a part of, um, the Swiss eight, uh, brand moving forward. We love having you, mate. You, your knowledge in, in health and fitness is obviously second to none and, and, and we're on the same page as far as life and how we, how we act. So, mate, we love having you as an ambassador. Love you, mate. Cheers. Cheers, boys. And there we have it, my interview with the boys from Swiss 8, Adrian Sutter and Anthony Meixner. Uh, Adrian came to me a couple of years ago uh, when Swiss 8 was just in its first concepts and he asked me to come on board. He explained what he was doing and uh, his vision, the direction that he wanted to move the app in uh, and the Swiss 8 as a whole organization. Uh, and I was 100% behind what he was doing and I dealt with some of the things that we've spoken about in this episode as well as a lot of my mates. Uh, a lot of my mates are dealing, still dealing with PTSD, anxiety, depression, things like that. Uh, and this is an ongoing uh, crisis in uh, the Western world. So i um, absolutely honored to be a part of the Swiss 8 team and work for them as an ambassador and I will be pushing their brand uh, to anyone who's going to listen and use these tools so we can hopefully save lives and help people be better at life. So 
Uh, any five-star ratings and reviews are much appreciated, guys. If you really got something out of this conversation, make sure you pass it off to your friends and family. Much love. Peace.